So, um, so if you uh, check the email that you uh, used for your registration, you should have got an EC2 instance. And if you click on it, it should uh, uh, take you to this uh, Jupyter Notebook page. Um, so A, you know, as per the prerequisite, I, you know, I said like you don't need to have a, a background in machine learning, deep learning, um, or computer vision. Uh, this is uh, an uh, ML 101 Python. Uh, you don't even need to have in-depth experience with Python, right? Um, uh, you're just going to click cells and you're going to walk through this process. And hopefully at the end of it, you would uh, know some machine learning, deep learning, and computer vision. So, um, you know, as, as uh, Matt said, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the new site leader here in Uri Champagne. It's been a little over a month. I'm also the lead data scientist at Court of Agri-Science. And you're gonna see some of the work I do and, and some interesting ideas that we've been pursuing uh, uh, for 2021 and for the future. So, you know, AI or machine learning, it's, it's been one of the one of popular, most, uh, most uh, you know, uh, used buzzwords around, uh, especially AI. And, you know, it, it basically, uh, the question is, can we have machines do intelligent stuff that humans do? Um, in, in computer science, the AI research, you know, is used as study of intelligence agents and uh, machine learning is, a, is kind of like a subset of AI and deep learning is a subset in the machine learning uh, uh, domain. So, you know, it's basically talking about uh, machine learning. Uh, you have, you know, the unsupervised, supervised learning or even reinforcement learning. There's, there's a lot of uh, interesting activity that's happening uh, in this area. Uh, and for what, we do in Corteva, uh, there is a lot of uh, work around machine learning and deep learning. So we have a data science and bioinformatics group. And you know, the, our, our slogan is from data to decision. So we, we take data for, from our R&D and from customers and we build uh, predictive models and decisions around data. So a lot of interesting work goes on like environment classification, crop health monitoring, uh, sales, uh, sales and uh, discount dashboard, you know, some kind of business analytics. Uh, deep learning for toxic engineering, protein analysis, and basically now the big goal is using mobile apps, drones to you know disease coding, disease monitoring, stress um, uh, to identify and and quantify uh, plant stress, and things like that. So a lot of work, and, and our data science uh, group within Corteva is very broad. So yesterday during the research part block party, you know. Uh, when students ask me, like, uh, what do you do in data science? I said, we don't do, we don't do one thing. We do a lot of different things. And our group is very diverse. We have bioinformatics, chem informatics, systems biology, environment science, remote sensing, imaging, business analytics. And we do different things. And each group has their own unique skill sets they, they bring to the table. So um, fun fact. <laughs> so you would see some, some of these fun facts um, in this um, uh, notebook. So uh, Arthur uh, Lee Samuel, he is the first person uh, to basically coined the term machine learning uh, in 1959. Uh, and if you use LaTeX, he's one of the uh, members of the tech community, initial members of the tech community. So uh, in this notebook, we use uh, OpenCV, Scikit-Learn, Pandas, NumPy, SciPy, and there's also TensorFlow, which is kind of missing uh, here. Um, so we are doing, we're going to do some hands-on deep learning. So uh, I want this session to be a little interactive. The way we could do it is you can use your thumbs up, thumbs down emojis so I can get some feedback from you as we go along. So how many of you have used uh, Scikit-Learn? Thumbs up, awesome, okay. So if you use Scikit-Learn and you've done some machine learning, uh, we're gonna, you know, based on the uh, form that you filled, I've got a, a good input about it. So uh, a lot of people know machine learning and then it goes gradually down to deep learning and very uh, and there's only a few people who have uh, expertise in computer vision. So this session should be very uh, interesting and useful to you, especially in that area. So uh, if you look at, you know, when a lot of uh, places where they, when they start with ML 101s, a very popular data set is IRIS data set. So this is uh, the IRIS flower data set or Fisher's IRIS data set. It's a multivariate data set that was introduced uh, to basically study these three types of uh, flowers, right? So the iris setosa, virginica, and versicolor. And the way they did that was they basically went ahead, you know, 
took samples and measured them, the width of the uh, sepal and the petal, and, and they collected samples and then used uh, machine learning models to see if they can predict what type of flower it is. So uh, now going to the Jupyter notebook, it's very simple. If you're not used to notebook, so these are the individual cells and the one we saw about are the markdowns. So if you click on the cell and then you click on the run button and, and it should run that particular cell. So the first step, uh, oh, the fun fact is uh, if you heard of the Z Fisher Z distribution, uh, it was again invented by Fisher in 1924. Uh, so let's dive into some machine learning, right? Um, so the first step is you, import scikit-learn and import data set, and then you import import the iris data set. So if you click the run button, it may take some time initially uh, if your instances are not, are not wound up. So, you, you know, we load uh, 50 samples of each of the uh, uh, flower types, and this is what the data looks like. So you have uh, the the uh, independent variables, and then you have the dependent variables. So zero is set as a one is Brazil color and two is Virginica. Uh, now, if we plot this data set and we plot it against uh, the sepal length and the sepal width, this is what uh, this is what the data would look like. Okay, perfect. See, that's the advantage of having some backup in instances. Okay, so uh, again, it's very simple. You have a two D two D plot, you have the sepal length and the, and the x-axis, sepal width and the y-axis, and then you have plotted the data, right? Uh, now, if a uh, simple question is if if I were to ask the question, how would you differentiate, or, or if you have to build a machine learning model, what, what would that model look like if you want to differentiate setosa versus non-setosa? You can type on the chat or you can unmute and but what would it be? What would be a simple uh, function that can differentiate setosa from non-setosa? I'll tell the answer. So it's, it's very simple. You would basically draw a line here, right? And that decision boundary, anything above the line, exactly. So thanks, JB. So anything above the line would be uh, setosa and anything below the line will be non-setosa. So that would be a simple linear classifier, right? Uh, now, if you want to differentiate between versicolor and virginica, then it's a difficult problem. So at that point, you have to do something else in the data to help you differentiate those two, um, uh, you know, those two flower types. And the way you would do it is basically add uh, another uh, feature or variable, right? Uh, and then when when you actually, if you can, three D, if you can visualize it somehow, then you can basically draw three. Uh, planes that would differentiate for most part the three uh, flower types. Uh, so for all prop for most problems, it might seem uh, simple. Like, okay, so basically get more features. More features means more, uh, more the ability to differentiate your uh, your classes. But that's not necessarily true. So we always deal with the curse of dimensionality. Uh, so basically, as the number of features increase, and or the dimensions grow, the amount of data or samples you need. Uh, grows exponentially, right? And to give you an idea why images, so this is where and I'm gonna talk about a lot of image, imaging now. So in images, why this problem is much more complicated is because you are dealing with pixels and each pixel is basically a feature. So I, I give this example, right? When people talk about a high dimension, when dealing with images saying that they're high dimensional uh, in nature, uh, so, there are only three channels in case of an RGB image or grayscale. In case of a grayscale image, you only have one channel. Then how is it high dimension? This is how it's. This is a good example to show why it's high dimension. So let's say you had, you had an eight by eight checker checkerboard example, right? And now each pixel is a feature, and in the checkerboard pattern. So you basically have eight uh, times eight, which is sixty four features. Now let's say each element or each pixel can take two values. They can take a zero or a one. So one is white and zero is black. And now the total elements in the feature space is two raised to 64. Uh, so that is this huge number. So if you brute, try to brute force and, and analyze each pattern uh, by spending one microsecond per pattern, so you would spend about uh, 5 million uh, or half a million uh, years to analyze all the patterns of this checkerboard. 
right? And that's humanly not possible. Now, if you go and look at an RGB image, which gets very interesting. So let's say you are dealing with uh, an RGB image. So you have uh, three channels. So, so you have uh, a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. And then each channel has a width and a height, right? So in this case, you have a width of 203 pixels, a height of 203 pixels, and there are RGB, there are three channels. So if you do the same thing, the fun fact is, if you have if the number of features is 203, the width times height times channel, that's the total number of pixels. And each pixel, instead of having two values, as we saw in the previous case, can have eight bits, which is 256 values that each pixel can carry. So the total number of unique samples you're dealing with is this number. And for those of you thinking how big this number is, this number is much more than the total number of stars in the known universe. So that's the total number of different types of images that you can generate. That's why when you deal with images, you'd say it's, it's a very high dimensional space. Now, it's obvious that we cannot analyze each and every image, right? So there has to be some way for us to compress these features. So the, the way we compress this feature space in, in, in images is through what's called as a histogram, right? Um, how many of you have heard a histogram? Thumbs up if you have. Okay, good. So the idea is very simple. You take a grayscale image and then that has 256, uh, each pixel can take 256 values. You basically bin them, right? You say how many, in this image, how many pixels have the value zero? How many pixels have the value one? How many pixels have the value two and so on? And now once you bin them, you have reduced your feature space to 256, right? So that's how small your, your features get. So once you have your histogram feature size is reduced, then it's easy for you to build machine learning models going back to how we built one uh, for your uh, for the iris problem, right? So uh, I, I'm not gonna go into these machine learning models. You already know, uh, you, most of you may have, may have known some of these models, right? So if you wanted to unsupervise clustering, you use k-means. If you run this particular thing, it's, it's running k-means on the, uh, uh, on the iris data set and you have three so basically you have three classes you have three three uh, means that are converging uh, and you know it's basically iteratively going through and, and finding what the cluster centers should be and then it has converged to those cluster centers then you have linear regression right basically what we saw before setosa versus non setosa then we have support vector machine which is uh, this is in, in in most cases if you uh, think of a linear support vector machine it's much closer to a, to a to a linear regression uh, classifier, but support vector machine has something called as a kernel trick, right? So for example, in this case, I, I generally give this example, right? You have different kernels, you have a polynomial or a uh, radial basis function or a, or a hyperbolic tangent or whatnot. So let's say you have a data where uh, you have these red dots and then you have these blue dots. So there's no way you can linearly separate this data set for these two classes. So the way we do this is we actually introduce a third, uh, a feature, which is a combination of the two features that you see, right? Uh, it could be a polynomial function that uh, represents these two uh, features. And then once you added the third feature, now uh, in, in now adding the third feature, you these two classes are now linearly separable with a plane. Uh, so that is basically the kernel trick. Uh, so that's one of the tricks. Uh, fun fact, this is very similar to if you have done any uh, computational geometry. This is similar to going from the point to line duality. So let's say you have uh, in, in the primal plane, you have uh, points, um, right? P1, P2, P3, which are collinear. Uh, so the P1, P2, P3 have an X and a Y coordinate. Now you could move to another coordinate space, which is called the dual plane, where the X and the Y coordinates can be treated as the slope and the intercept. So point P1 becomes a line P1 uh, star, point P2 becomes line P2 star, point, P, line, point P3 becomes line P3. And on the dual plane, all these three lines will intersect to be the point L, L star. Now, if you actually go back from the dual plane to the primal plane where L is the line, right? You take its uh, slope uh, M and uh, Y intercept C, and you go back, that'll be 
the point L X comma Y on the dual plane will be the slope and the line uh, slope and the intercept on the private planes. This is the point line duality, right? So mathematically, you're going from one uh, coordinate space to another, and in, and an inverse should exist for you to uh, do this kind of trade. Uh, then you have the decision tree, which again, I'm not going to go too much into it. It's it's very simple. It's uh, basically you, you make a decision, you go from the top uh, of the tree all the way to the leaf nodes, and then you make a decision at the end. Uh, and this is much more interpretable. And uh, uh, this is again, you have uh, many variations of decision tree, decision tree. And then you have the very popular artificial neural network, right? So you have, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, biologically inspired. There has been a lot of work in the past 20 years or 20 years with artificial neural network. Uh, basically you have an input, uh, you have input uh, neural nodes and then you have an output node and then you have the hidden layers and then each neuron from the input, you, you know, they connect all the inputs. For example, let's say you take a hidden uh, a neuron in the hidden layer, right? So uh, each neuron in the hidden layer is connected to every other uh, neuron in the previous layer. And then you propagate the input from uh, from your input layer all the way to the output layer. Uh, there's a lot more math to it, uh, where we you do uh, the the feed forward and the back propagation, and then you know you have an optimizer that that does it. So, long story short, this is biologically inspired, and the deep learning uh, that you see today with convolutional neural networks, your reinforcement learning uh, generative adversarial neural networks, uh, transformer models, they all are fundamentally derived from the, your artificial neural network architecture that you see here. So um, the, the uh, question that uh, you know I've been asked and are, a lot of times people ask this question is what type of model should I use? There's no one uh, answer to that. There's no one model that's, you know, as soon as you look at the data, you're not going to say, okay, this part's going to work. So there are a lot of, uh, some people do it a trial and error or basically use uh, some kind of a logic based on the data set you have. Um, so this the, the this is uh, these tables that that are available online. So I've, I've wanted to show this, uh, and it depends on the uh, the problem type whether you want that data to be interpretable. For example, neural networks are not uh, are not interpretable or it's not easily interpretable. Uh, then you have the prediction accuracy, training speed, prediction speed, and so on and so forth. So you based on a lot of these parameters, you would go ahead and choose the model that uh, would best fit for your data set. So uh, from here, we're going to move into deep learning. Uh, any questions? If uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm going to pause here. If not, we'll move to the interesting part. Okay, going once, twice, thrice. Okay, perfect. So uh, this is kind of the more interesting part of the workshop. Okay, uh, deep learning or deep structured learning or hierarchical learning. It's it's again. Uh, a subset of the machine learning. It's very popular, right? So if someone says they do machine learning today, they're primarily doing, most of them are primarily doing deep learning, uh, even the, especially in the computer vision community, right? But a lot of papers that you would see, it's, it's mostly deep learning. So um, let's let's go into the, uh, into the cell, uh, uh, into the Jupyter Notebook cells, and, and let's look at a very classic data set for deep learning. So if you look at the MNIST data set, it's kind of like the deep learning 101. Um, so MNIST data set is, has been very popular. Uh, these are handwritten digits. Um, and the idea was, uh, for, you, for especially for USPS, right? So if you had your zip code, some way to quickly analyze what, uh, you know, what, what, what the zip code meant and then sort, uh, sort your mails. Is the cell working for others? And you click. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the TensorFlow carries imports. Yeah, that works fine. Okay. I don't know why. Oh, it could work for me now. Okay, perfect. So um, the first step here is basically you, you download the MNIST data set, and then we are going to download uh, the Keras uh, library inside TensorFlow. And then we're going to define the sequential uh, model, uh, some dense dense model. We're going to add a dropout layer and an activation layer, right? Um, so let's click on this one. Okay. So now uh, 
the step is to basically download the data set. So we have 60,000 images. Each image is a, a one channel. It's a grayscale image with a single channel, 28 pixel by 28 pixel. And then you have the Y value, which is the value that uh, the dependent variable. Uh, and uh, you have uh, uh, 10 classes, so zero to nine. So this is what the images look like. So for example, this is a, a handwritten digit of five. So that's class five, zero, uh, four, one, nine, two, and so on and so forth. Uh, and in, in this step, what we do is we are going to do some uh, uh, formatting of the data for training. So convert the data, the images into floating point, uh, and then we normalize it. So as I told you, each pixel is between zero to 255. So when we divide it by 255, they're all normalized to zero to one. And if you run the cell, we have uh, normalized that data set. Um, and then we reshape it, right? So you take your 28 pixel by 28 pixel, which is now, uh, which is basically a, a matrix. And then we just stretch it out to uh, uh, a vector of length 784. Uh, then we define your uh, um, dependent variable here, right? Basically we do what's called as a one hot encoding. So if you have a five, which means the fifth bit is one. If you have a seventh, then your seventh, uh, uh, it's, it's from the other bit. So in this case, this is the zeroth bit, this is the uh, nth bit. So it's one, two, three, four, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Um, that's one. And same case here from you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's one. You could also do the other way around it, it doesn't matter. Uh, as long as you keep track of which, which one uh, maps to which class. And at the end, right, uh, now we are done with some data pre-processing. Now you want to set up and build your neural network. So it's, it's the architecture is very simple. You have an input, which takes 784 uh, uh, features. And then we define two hidden layers. And then your output layer is the total number of classes, which is the 10, 10 neurons. So we define um, our deep learning, uh, or in this case, a simple neural network. So we define a sequential model. Um, and then we have an input of 784 that came from our input images, which is 28 by 28 and stretched into a vector. And then we add our first hidden layer, which is 512 neurons in the first hidden layer. Um, then we have an activation layer. So I think of activation layer is what fires the neurons. In this case, we are add, adding a rectified uh, uh, linear unit. We could add a sigmoid function. We could have a, add a hypertangent function. We could add any function, mathematical function here that would serve uh, for activating that particular neuron. The dropout layer we add uh, here as a 20% dropout, which means at any point of time, 20% of these neurons will not fire. The reason why we do this is basically, we don't want the neurons to memorize based on the input. So this will avoid the overfitting problem, right? Uh, for your training data. And we add another uh, hidden layer of 512 neurons. We do the same thing. We add an activation that we add a dropout. And then at the end of it, we add our output layer, which is the, your 10 classes starting from zero to nine. And then for the output layer, we add an activation function of softmax. So you can read all about all of this in the Keras documentation, it's really good. And then we finally print out the model summary. Okay, so when you look at the model summary, right, we have the parameters, that's the total number of parameters that is computed uh, when you have a single input in the feed forward, right? And if you count the total number of parameters, we have about uh, 670,000 parameters, right? So about two thirds of a million, close to that. Uh, so those are the total number of parameters that are computed every time you run through the through this deep, through this uh, neural network. Uh, then at the end, what we do is we compile the model. Uh, so we have to specify a few more things, which is what type of optimizer, what type of uh, metrics we use for accuracy, and what loss function we use. So if you run the cell, uh, your model should be compiled. And then you know, uh, for uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, uh, who may not have worked on this. Uh, think of the loss function as uh, if if uh, if you have uh, a ground truth value and you have a predicted value, you're just saying how close is my predicted value to the actual ground truth. So the different functions for this, the most popular one that almost everyone uses is, is start with is the mean square error, right? And there are other loss functions. Uh, you have the absolute error or the uh, smooth absolute error, or in this case, we use the uh, categorical cross entropy. Uh, then you have the optimizer. That's basically some kind of a, a, a compass or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, something that tells you if you're heading in the right direction. So let's say you, you know, I, I give this example, if, if you see a mountain and you want to go to the, the, the 
peak of the mountain, but you're at the at the foot of the mountain, and, and you need to basically plan which uh, which direction you need to climb the mountain to reach to the peak uh, in the either the least possible uh, path uh, or the fastest path, whatever whatever uh, you are seeking out. Uh, and if if you're looking at the the math behind all of this deep learning, it's a lot. But for most purposes, of, I, I you know when you're starting, I would suggest you don't you read the math later. You can just import Keras or import TensorFlow and start building your deep learning model. Um, this is what I suggest for people who have not started deep learning. Don't worry about the math. You will learn math. You will learn the math as you go. Uh, as you start using these libraries, using each optimizer, you will learn on the uh, uh, on the way. Uh, so this is the key step after you've compiled the model. You're going to train or you're going to, you're going to fit the model with the data. So when you run this uh, model that fit you send the training data, which is your input images, then you send the output for the input. You basically send, uh, uh, not, you don't send all the input, you send the inputs in batches, right? So the batch size is 128. Uh, we are running only for four epochs for now, um, right? We could run it for as many epochs as based on the loss function, how, as to how the loss function drops. Um, and then you have the validation data uh, that is used to, that we initially had the, the, the entire data split into training and validation. So you have the X test and Y test. So the model is, is run. Now you see that the loss function actually goes down. It started with 0.25 and it went to 0 0.05. That's good, which means your model is learning on the data set. Uh, then you see the accuracy going up. That's good. And the most important part is here, the validation loss, because this is what the model is not seeing or it's not using for the training. So your validation loss is going down and your categorical loss, uh, categorical validation accuracy is going up too. So that's good. Uh, then what we do is we finally evaluate our model. So we take the test, test data set, the holder test data set, and we run it through this model. So when you run it, we get the total number of test images uh, we used as 10,000. We get a test uh, loss of 0 0.07 and a test accuracy of about 97%. So that's really good. So we just four epochs, we've got about 97% accuracy. And if you think about 20, 24 years back, the MNIST data set was still, or you know, the 100 in digits was still an open problem in the computer vision community. Same with OCR. So if you run the prediction now and to inspect the output, uh, you get, uh, you're basically looking at how did the model do and visualize what are the correct uh, indices and the incorrect ones. So in this case, these are the correct ones. So the model predicted is seven and the class is seven. But in this case, the model predicted this as a nine for a class two or an eight for class nine. And you can see why it could have done it. For example, in this case, it thought that we have five is actually eight because this loop was not closed. So those, those are kind of like the errors that your model has. Um, so what we saw is not a convolution neural network. What we saw was a fully connected um, artificial neural network. But what's important uh, what's interesting now, a lot of uh, imaging in the imaging community, people use convolutional neural networks. So the way convolutional neural networks work is in the step we saw before where every neuron in, 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 a, in the layer is connected to every other neuron in the previous layer. That is not the case here. So you have what is called as a convolution kernel that goes over the image and it extracts the output from that image. And then you do some kind of a max pooling for the outputs that are extracted. And then you go through multiple uh, layers of convolution for by max pooling uh, followed by activation and so on. And as you can see, then the feature, you know, you basically are uh, featured uh, in the latent space, your feature uh, dimension actually keeps going down. And then at the end, you would have an output layer, which you use to predict. So uh, this is where I'm going to show some of the ag examples and three common problems. So in this case, you know, this is a very simple toy data set where you have images of soy and images of corn. Right, and uh, what we want to do is we want to do something similar to what we did before, but use a convolution neural network to build a deep learning model that can differentiate uh, an input image uh, as soy or as corn. So we define the deep learning model parameters. We have a train uh, training batch size. We define a validation batch size, the number of training steps, validation steps. We're going to have the number of epochs for now as four. Uh, the number of classes is two, which is the corn and the soy, and then we resize the image. We 
we reduce the image dimension just to make it faster. Right? You could actually train the model on the original image data size if you wanted to, which is 730 pixel by 486. Uh, then we extract the training and the test data set, similar to what we did uh, before for the MNIST. Um, and you can use the scikit-learn train test split here. So once we've done that, and we, this, is the, this is a very interesting uh, step, uh, but I'm going to skip it. It's, it's a lot of things to explain. But in short, what we are doing is we are defining what's called as a generator or image generator. So it, it basically takes your entire data set, breaks it into chunk, and then you can augment it by flipping those images as horizontal, vertically. You can uh, zoom in, you can pan the image, or you can even change the color uh, uh, space if you wanted to. You could do very interesting augmentations uh, to your image. So we're gonna just run this cell for now. And then what we do is we build, we don't use the VGG16 model. So this is uh, a model that's, if I'm not wrong, it's 2015 or 2016 from Oxford University. Um, very old, but still a robust model. We're gonna use the VGG16 like architecture in our case uh, for, the, for this problem. Um, so you see there's a convolutional plus an activation, then there's a max pooling. And then you also have the dense layers or the fully connected layers and then a soft max at the end. Uh, so this is the architecture, right? Uh, it looks like the VGG16 architecture. So you send your input image in three dimension and you have a 2D convolution with uh, a three by three kernel, 32 of uh, 32 such kernels. And then you have the activation function, which is uh, your radio. Then you add another convolution layer and then you do max pooling, right? And then you repeat this block several times. In this case, you add another layer, two convolutions followed by max pooling, but now I've increased my uh, convolution kernels to 64. And then you add another one. And then you basically flatten, flatten is, like I said before, you take your 2D image and then you make it a, a, a vector. And then you add the dense layer, which is similar to what we saw before, dropout followed by another dense layer, another dropout, and the number of classes is two. So that's your final output layer. And now if you run this one, um, you would see that the model parameters is now 12 million compared to less than 1 million in the previous case. Then you will compile your deep learning model again. In this case, uh, same thing, we're gonna use a categorical cross entropy, we're gonna use an atom optimizer, um, and then we're going to run our uh, training, the model fit function. In this case, I'm not passing the input data, as you can see, I'm passing a generator. So the generator will take batches of my images, do the augmentation and send it to my model fit method. And you can see it's running the epochs. This is much slower than, it will be slower than what you saw before with the MNIST data set. Um, and then I save the weights in, in a weight file, um, which is save underscore weights underscore con dot h5. Uh, is the training completed for any of you? Did it finish all the four epochs? Yeah, it actually went pretty fast for me. I think I shouldn't have been on Corteva's network. I should have either um, been on my hotspot. Maybe it's... Yeah, I think the epics were like less than 10 seconds each. Yes. Um, I think I can... I don't want to switch now. <laughs> oh, maybe I should have done that before. See, I think the first call takes 80 seconds, but the other ones are okay. five. I think it's probably the network and maybe something is happening. Okay, it's good. So as you can see, uh, the same thing, the loss is going down. Our accuracy for the training data is going up. Uh, the loss actually went down and then went up again, which is uh, could be just that this validation data set was uh, the model couldn't predict well on this batch. Uh, but then uh, at the at the next cell, what I do is what I did was I actually ran this model for twenty five epochs, and then I saved it into this card. So I uh, I saved the weight files. And now, if you actually predict on the test data set, uh, it's actually uh, running it through the two hundred and fifty images that I had on my holdout test data set. And if I predict the labels, so I've done the prediction here. So converted the output. So the output as, uh, and I wanted to maybe quickly show you this. So the output, if you see it's it's 
the value from the two uh, output uh, layers that you have, right? And you have, uh, this one is a number that's very close to a zero, and this one is a number that's very close to a one. So the one, so basically you, uh, the one that's closer to one is the class output uh, that the model is predicting. And then we convert it into a class label, which is either con or a soy. And then how good our model did, we can look at the confusion matrix and for the 250 holder test data set, it predicted uh, soy almost uh, 100% accuracy. There was one con image that it predicted as a soy. So that's, that was only outlier. So our model did really good. So this is a good example of an image classification, right? Uh, so you basically take an image and you classify it into a given task. But in most cases, we want to know what that object is on top of it, or we want to locate the object. So uh, another problem in computer vision that's very popular is the object detection problem or multiple object detection, extensively used to in, uh, in autonomous cars to basically look at pedestrians, other cars, traffic signs, and whatnot. In ag, we use it in the greenhouse, for example, you want to locate objects, or in the field, you want to identify, okay, which part is the plants uh, shoot, what are, where are the leaves, where is the con ear, where's the tassel and things like that. Uh, so in this case, what I'm gonna show is uh, a faster RCNN model. Again, this is an older model that are much more newer uh, object detection models now. There's like, for example, efficient uh, uh, detection model from Google that came out in 2020, uh, which I've used, it's really good. So in, in this case, you think of it like your output, it's not uh, just one problem, you're predicting two outputs. You're predicting, where the object is, which is the bounding box regressor. And then you're also predicting what that object is using the same classification method that you saw before. So if you run this cell, this is a, a Kaggle uh, 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 competition for global wheat head detection. So the idea is to locate where the wheat head is, uh, wheat heads are on the image. So uh, a simple way to do this is instead of coding everything, you basically set up TensorFlow object detection API and you can take the fast RCNN with the ResNet uh, 101 model as its backend. And then there's a training step. So what we get is uh, we get ground truth data set for this. So the ground truth data set is basically the image, uh, its dimensions, uh, what class it is, and then the bounding box location. And then we can actually, I've, I've already trained the mo model for this one, that if you actually uh, looked at So uh, what we are doing is we are inferring the detection on the image uh, with the with the input image we got. We are getting the image output. We're getting the bounding box. We're getting the label. We're getting the score. And I've already built the model for the object detection here, uh, so we don't have to train because the training takes anywhere between eight to twelve hours, uh, depending on um, your input image resolution. For example, it can start with ten twenty four by ten twenty four, or five twelve by five twelve. So this is what the output looks like. So you know the model basically took an input image, and then it generated the output image with the bounding boxes on it. And it also has the bounding box, the labels and the score. So if I want to um, print bounding boxes, I can do that here. So those are the bounding boxes that are generated um, on this image. Uh, the third problem, which is again very popular, is the uh, image segmentation or semantic segmentation and uh, either instant segmentation, there are multiple names. So the idea is now you not only want to know where the object is, locate the object and what the object is, you also want to know the contour, shape, or how many pixels actually contributed to the object. In this case of an instant segmentation, you want to identify each leaf in this plant separately. So there are again several object detect uh, the segmentation models, right? Uh, the segment model is the very early one that we used, um, and I have used. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of another model called the UNet uh, model. So uh, applied to a problem for soy cyst nematode detection. So soy cyst nematode is a uh, is a uh, parasite that's uh, in the soy plant uh, at the root structure and it causes a lot of damage, billions of dollars. Uh, of damage for farmers. So the idea is, can we build a, a simple machine learning model or deep learning model to identify how what is the infestation or how many cysts are there in the image? So in this case, you see uh, this is a sample with some root structures with some sand and cysts. And as you can see, the cysts are like these tiny objects in, inside this dish that, that, are, the, that are the cysts. Uh, so if you run the next cell, this actually 
cropped a part of the image and now you can probably see the cyst much more. Uh, oh, so this one uh, is the half, half circle detection. Basically, I want, the first step is to identify the background versus the uh, foreground versus the background. So I'm just detecting a circle, identifying where the sample is. And then if you actually run this, then you can see the crop, uh, uh, a 128 by 128 patch of that foreground image. And this is where the cyst location is. Uh, then I've trained an SCN unit model, right? If you run this, um, this is basically defining the unit model architecture. Uh, it has about 2 million parameters. And then we, uh, you know, do the same process that we did before. In this case, I'm defining, I'm compiling the model and, and I'm also loading the pre-trained weights for this, which I've already trained for this, uh, for this model. And then at the end, we take uh, the sample SCN patch image, uh, we expand the dimensions, then we convert it to float, normalize it, and then we do the prediction on the model. Uh, and then once we get the predicted output, as you can see, it's a, a value between zero to one, and then we apply some thresholding. And this is after the thresholded input model, and this is the ground truth. So as you can see that the model is able to accurately predict on this patch. And then once you run this model on, on multiple patches of the image and stitch the image back together, then you have uh, all the SCNs located on your original image, and then you can derive a count or how many pixels, how big were the cis, and you can derive more statistics out of it. So those are the three things I wanted to share, right? Uh, basically, we started with fundamental machine learning idea, what features mean, uh, and then what does feature mean in images? Look at three key computer vision problems, such as image classification, multiple object detection, and image segmentation. There is more to deep learning than, than what I've shown, right? So uh, you can do deep learning for style transfer, right? So basically you take an input RGB image and then you can run it through a model and it'll generate uh, what this image would look like in, in any of the uh, painting or art forms. It could be like a Monet or a Manga and it'll basically generate an output image. Uh, image colorization. So if you have a grayscale image, it'll automatically colorize that image for you based on a lot of data that you've provided to train the model. Image reconstruction of the missing pixels, the model can reconstruct the image. Uh, image super resolution. So if you have a low resolution image, then it can actually generate what would a high resolution image look like. Right? This is the original image. This is the image generated from a super resolution GAN model. Um, and that's how you know you can see that's pretty close to what, what it would have looked like uh, to the original image. You can also generate new images, right? Uh, new faces, new emotions, whatnot. Uh, this is basically used extensively for data augmentations. So if you don't have enough data, uh, uh, image data, you can actually use GANs to generate uh, new data um, and, and use it to train your downstream machine learning model or deep learning model. Then you have the image uh, to image translation or domain to domain translation. So you give this model a bunch of horse images or a bunch of zebra images, and then you can train the model to go from a horse to zebra or back. Um, this one is very new. I don't know how many of you have seen it before. If not, it's very exciting. So this is called deep nostalgia. Uh, again, this is a GAN-based model. So you give it an input image and the model will animate that input image for you. Uh, very exciting. Uh, and we are now working using this, which is the Gaugan, NVIDIA's Gaugan, another cool idea where you can doodle and it'll re generate photorealistic images uh, for you. The GAN will generate photorealistic images. Uh, so think of this as more like in this, if you don't have certain image images that you can capture, but if someone can actually draw what the map, segmentation map would look like, and then you can probably, with some data, you can actually learn what the original image would have been for that. Uh, but what's cool is not just that, you can also change what the image would look like under different lighting conditions um, or, or even like different uh, capture, maybe cameras or different capture, capture method, methods. That's very interesting. Um, another area that we are interested in is the robotics and object manipulation, right? This is from OpenAI, so basically without actually this is unsupervised without actually telling the robotic arm what to do. Can the can the uh, can you use the deep learning model to teach the robotic arm to manipulate the object to whatever desired uh, state you want it to be? 
where is this useful in ag think of all the farm bots or drones that you're flying can you unsuper in an unsupervised method teach them what they should do uh, ai in gaming uh, again very popular uh, i'm a big fan of dota 2 so if you saw open ai 5 for dota and there are much there are several others for like uh, the alpha go and things like that so it's very exciting to see that AI can solve or play games as good as pro players. So it's fascinating. Uh, the problem that I'm currently working on, which I'm which I'm very super excited about, is the multi-agent interaction. Right? This is also unsupervised. If you have a problem where you want the agents to solve that problem automatically without someone actually teaching it, teaching the agents to do that, uh, that'll be that'll be awesome. Right? Again, same thing. Application in ag could be. Uh, if you want your farm bots to to, to uh, navigate through your field uh, and you want to want them to do that automatically, uh, automatically irrigate, automatically do pesticides, insecticides, apply apply uh, targeted uh, products, uh, uh, you know, crop protection products, things like that. So this is another area that I think uh, is for me it's very interesting and very unique and challenging. So those are kind of I wanted to give you the big picture of what new and exciting things are in deep learning. And hopefully at the end of it, you know, if you've seen the Matrix movie, within this one hour, you know deep learning now. Um, so uh, I'm open for questions. I know we only have two minutes, but I, I can maybe stay a few more minutes and I'll be open for more questions if you have. Yeah, thank you so much, Shreya. This is great. I mean, I think it just, you know, about 45, 50 minutes, you really covered a ton um, just from introduction to ML and then just going through um, so the deep learning techniques for computer vision. I guess one question I'll say is, so if someone, you know, gets a taste of this and they want to go deeper, especially in computer vision, you talk about different use case at the end, like what would be a next step? Like they got to walk through your notebook for them doing something hands on themselves. What would be maybe a, a next step for them? Yeah, I, I, I generally feel like, you know, uh, don't, don't look at the problems that already exist. Uh, and if you're a student, I, 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 the one thing I will tell you is if you're interested in, in looking at the computer vision area, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of open, interesting problems. The, the, like the, you said about the hackathon, I'm sure that there are so many open problems, interesting ideas. So you, the first basic step is you define a problem, right? Come up with your own idea. Then the next step is collecting data. So you have your you or your friends capture images. And then the next step is, uh, I shouldn't say it's easy, but it's pretty well defined. Then you can go to Keras documentation or TensorFlow documentation. And then once you define the problem, you, which is, okay, I want to take images and I want to classify them. And I want to solve this problem or build this model. And then from there on, it's much more simple. Unless you, like you cannot do this till you have a problem and a data uh, and, and data to go with. So I, I don't know if that answered the question, but. Yeah, that's good uh, advice. Yeah, to, to not just, you know, find a random website, but just actually think about, you know, what's relevant. Yeah. And I think I think that you would you would uh, exactly and, and you would feel accomplished that you have actually taken a problem which maybe no one you know have solved it and then you solve it and maybe you can also put it on your GitHub page but and that that'll be a good good project to showcase also maybe in one of the courses if you if they take a course or even if you're in a company if you're working this would be a cool project if you have a hackathon in your company and you're never done computer vision could solve some problem in your company that has a that would benefit from a vision component to it. Okay, well, yeah, if, if you guys uh, have any other uh, questions, um, I think, Shreena, I don't know if you gave your information. Um, oh, um, your information at the top of the notebook, maybe. Let me look I, yeah, I can uh, type my email or, or, you, or they should have got an email from me. Uh, That's true. Yeah. Because you emailed people that registered. Yep. Yes. Okay. So if you have questions, they can. Yeah. Or I put my email in the chat. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, uh, if you have specific okay. questions, I would be happy uh, to help. Um, and again, thanks for your, thanks for taking your time. Thanks for, you know, uh, attending this session. Um, and also if possible, I, I, I don't know if Matt, you plan to do this, but uh, if you want to send out, we can talk about it, maybe quick feedback if, if if that's possible. I would like to know if what people think about it. Is, did they like it? Is it good? Sure. Is yeah, it... we can. Yeah. People have comments or feedback. I will to... really appreciate that. Or how to make it yeah. even better if I do this uh, another time. Thanks again, Matt, for giving me this opportunity.